So I think uh, that we can uh, we can start uh, this uh, uh, webinar. So it's my pleasure actually to welcome uh, all of you for these uh, two hours uh, or webinar organized uh, by uh, Puzen. And I'm very happy to see uh, all of my friends. Uh, we are together for, for two hours and uh, we will discuss uh, uh, not only the, the new uh, flexible Dura telescope from, uh, from Puzen, but we will also talk in general regarding the, the technique of a flexible Dura telescopy. And we will try to uh, address uh, two uh, main uh, points. Uh, the first one is regarding the, the size of the Ura telescope, just to uh, demonstrate that a smaller Ura telescope is really uh, something that we need today. And we will also discuss another point, very important regarding irrigation. As you know that uh, uh, we need actually to optimize uh, irrigation um, in uh, flexible uh, Ura telescopy, but also to uh, respect some uh, uh, intrarenal uh, uh, pressure. So uh, I think we can start. We have uh, eight uh, talks, uh, very interesting as, as you will see. And the, the first one is um, a, a general talk. And um, this is uh, Christian Zeitz from uh, Austria. And he will talk about uh, indications of flexible ureteroscopy in 2021. Christian? You can yes okay great hello olivier i hope you can hear me well thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you for Pusen for the invitation to have this talk so retrograde intravenous surgery and indications the place of single years flexible ureteroscopy um this year's EAU guidelines uh, for RILS state that an experienced hand stones up to three centimeter can be treated and there's no size limit if percutaneous nephrolithotomy is no option and stage procedures are accepted. And as RILS achieves higher stone free rates that, mm, than shockwave lithotripsy, it is an alternative, especially if unfavorable factors for SWL are present, such as a steep infundibular pelvic angle or very hard stones. Complex stones may be treated with an endoscopic combined intravenal approach, allowing for visualization of the puncture site and branched calyces, otherwise necessitating multiple punctures. RIS is also an option for the pre-transplant kidney as retrograde access to transplant kidneys is difficult due to the anterior location of the ureteral anastomosis and urethral tortuosity. And treatment of donor stones may be needed pre-transplant and increase the pool available for renal transplants. A systematic review evaluating the outcome of pre versus post-transplant ureteroscopy demonstrated a favorable 100% stone free rate with an overall 7.5% complication rate um, compared to an overall complication rate of 13% for, for post-transplant ureteroscopy. Um, in pediatric stones, Recent studies reported stone free rates of 75 to 100%, with retreatment rates of 0 to 19%, and complication rates were rather low. So, it is also an indication for pediatric stones increasingly with smaller instruments. In anticoagulated patients, RILS is indicated as the only treatment option as shockwave lithotripsy and percutaneous nephrolithotomy are contraindicated. The AU guidelines on upper urinary tract urethral carcinoma state that um, upper urinary tract carcinoma suggests nephron sparing management as the primary treatment option, not only in patients with a low risk uh, tumors, but also in patients with kidney deficiency and severe comorbidities. In addition, for patients with multifocal up to three centimeter upper tract tumors with low grade pathological findings, RIOS might become a more common treatment. In an in vitro performance study at the time with a first generation Pusen device, it was demonstrated that various single use scopes can have comparable and even favorable characteristics in terms of weight, field view, resolution, 
and deflection compared to reuse devices. The irrigation of flow of single flow use was even better than the flow of uh, reusable scopes or working channel being free or occupied with various instruments. So all in all, um, these data and also these uh, papers uh, provided here provide evidence that disposable and reusable ureteroscopes are comparable in terms of quality and efficacy. So in terms of quality and efficacy, the indications for single and reusable scopes are actually not different. But economic aspects, such as reduction of repair costs, potential risk of contamination and sterilization efforts, as well as additional waste and uh, operator comfort need to be taken into account. And this is especially true for complex procedures with large stones. Because with increasing stone volume, the number of fragments increases rapidly and necessitates multiple entry and exit maneuvers, increasing the risk for instrument failure as do larger, harder stones in which OR time is longer compared, for example, to softer stones. Large tumors or large hard stones and a complex renal anatomy lead to longer lasering time, increased mechanical stress, and to more frequent instrument failure. Um, the study from Ozimek et al., it's an image on the, on the left side, results here suggested that a steep intundibolo pelvic angle, regardless of the complexity of the um, stone retrieval, influenced the durability of reusable devices. And the vast majority of flexible ureteroscopies defects occurred when the measured pelvic angle reached 60 degrees or less. And moreover, it was noticed that relatively many defects, more than 7%, occurred even in diagnostic procedures. So therefore, for example, the infundibular pelvic angle may play a potential role in device manage, not only in typical cases with uh, lower uh, pole kidney stones. Regarding costs, uh, we have another talk on that, but um, I just want to, to point out, this is a study from Margaret Al, that depending on purchase prices, costs may exceed the lower limit of cost for reusable ureteroscopes. After a certain number of procedures, um, in this study, it was after 61 procedures, and in case of higher costs of purchase prices, the upper limit of costs for reusable ureteroscopes uh, was reached after 118 procedures. Um, so this prospective cohort study provided a realistic view on a program at a resident training university stone center performing flexible ureteroscopy. And depending on the amount of interventions and the case volume you have and the purchase price, it depends if this is a um, eff efficacy, efficacy um, to, to use reusable or single-use scopes. Another issue is the, the carbon footprint, the waste. Flexible ureteroscopic raw materials comprise about 90% of plastic, 4% of steel, 4% of electronics, and 2% of rubber. The carbon footprint, which is a kilogram of uh, carbon monoxide per case uh, of reusable flexible ureteroscopes was calculated using previously validated models for obtaining data on manufacturing, sterilization, repackaging, um, repair, and uh, also solid waste disposal. Um, Single-use scopes are by definition creating an increase of plastic and metal waste products. On the other hand, the lack of reprocessing could be more environmentally friendly due to the decrease in use of aggressive detergent, disinfecting products, a part of being carbon neutral. Of notice, um, none of the companies um, have an active program of collection and recycling of used disposable scopes with a consequent lack of a preferred pathway for waste recycling. So this will probably change if uh, consumption of single-use scopes increases as uh, recycling will become more cost-effective. Bronchioscopes 
and gastrointestinal scopes um, most frequently reported as bearing pathogens regarding contaminations because of interventions. And if endoscopes do not attain a sufficiently high level of disinfection, they may cause outbreaks of healthcare acquired infections. And there was a reported outbreak of an ertapenem resistant Enterobacter cloacae urinary tract infection. And that was due to the disinfection failure of a contaminated ureteroscope, which had been colonized by the resistant clone. So if two consecutive or more patients develop infections after procedure, especially if the same clinically relevant microbial species are involved, the existence of an outbreak of infection should be highly suspected and the prompt investigation should be initiated. And this scenario might be avoided if you use a single use scope, which can by definition not be infected prior to the procedure. So I come to my conclusions and with today, single use scopes or retrograde intraduminal surgery interventions can be performed similar to reusable instruments. However, imaging features as narrowband imaging or PDD are currently not available in those devices. The indication for use of a single use scope depends mainly on, on first on patient factors. And this is best for large multifocal ablative tumors or large hard stones harboring an increased risk of instrument failure. Second, additionally, single use instruments are indicated in complex anatomic situations including difficult to access cartilages and in, for example, steep infundibular pelvic angles. Other indications depend on the surgical team and include, for example, complex procedures as endoscopic combined intrarenal surgery um, approaches usually, but also for teaching purposes, for example. For the nursing staff, it is convenient to open a single use scope, dispose it, and directly after the procedure. For the surgeon, for example, the median thumb and wrist fatigue scores tend to be better in contrast to the standard reusable ureteroscope, especially in long lasting procedures uh, with low weight scopes as the Pusen has just 91 gram. And I think everybody who's doing long procedures um, appreciates a uh, lightweight ureteroscope. The hospital operator or the urology department may find single use scopes more suitable for low volume centers since it may be a more expensive option at high volume centers, but this is very independently, very individually to be seen, depending on many factors which need to be individualized for any institution, case volume, cost for repair, sterilization, staff, purchase prices for scopes, they all need to be taken into, into consideration to define indications for single use scopes. There is an interest to define indications for single-use scopes as they warrant the availability of intact instruments, avoiding time-consuming and costly rescheduling of patients, which is also very negative, and which will have a negative impact also on the institutional um, reputation. Then we have the environmental aspects, which also might influence uh, decisions. However, at the moment so far, there are no clear advantages for either device at least looking at the carbon footprint, uh, seeming to be comparable between both types. Regarding safety of contamination, so far only sporadic iatrogenic bacterial infections caused by uh, insufficient sterilization have been reported. However, single use scopes warrant additional safety as the potential, potential catastrophic risk of infected spread by instrument contamination is eliminated. And although the clinical implications of contaminated uh, scopes are currently unknown, the existence of previous contamination represents a good argument in favor of those single use scopes. So finally, additionally to calculated costs, non-calculable uh, benefits as improved ergonomics, environmental aspects and rare but potentially um, cost intensive safety issues all individually influence the decision for defining the place and the indication for the single use scopes. So continued innovation and competition, I think at the moment in instrumentation development will lead to further expanding indications being very likely more cost effective. Thank you very much for your listening.
Thank you, uh, Christian, for your excellent talk and I would say excellent view regarding the, the, the place of uh, flexi single use flexible urethra scrap. Um, I really like uh, a lot the view that uh, you gave uh, today. Um, Christian, just a few questions because we have a few minutes. First, I'm, I'm still surprised to see that uh, in, in, in to the guidelines, we still keep these uh, largest diameter uh, to discuss indications between shockwave, flexi, and, and PCN. When do you think that we will start to consider uh, the total stone volume? And of course, the, the, the stone density according to the, the type of the stones. No, I think I think you're absolutely right, and it is. I think for everybody who's who's operating on stones, clear that all those factors you just mentioned very much influence the efficacy of any any procedure. And the guidelines so far um, help themselves out, saying that in experienced hands, um, also the indications are wider. We can also treat larger stones. So this is a first step. But uh, at the end, the guidelines reflect. Uh, the studies they exist. Yeah? It is it is something we have to look for the studies for the for the evidence. And if it is reported, then the guidelines actually can react. And I think that of course the stone volume, the hardness of the stone, as you mentioned, and also patient factors play a crucial role. Cru crucial role. And with uh, additional um, evidence we have, and a lot of studies are out there at the moment, and there's a lot of publications. I think this will change accordingly uh, within the next uh, guideline publications. Okay. And um, what, what do you think we are missing actually uh, regarding uh, single use uh, or, or even the, the, the regular flexible European scope? Just to, to, to improve, to increase in terms of indications, what, what, what do we miss actually to, to do better or to, to go further in terms of um, stone treatment? Yeah, I mean, Regarding uh, what can we do better, there are probably uh, certain aspects. The first is, of course, efficacy of treatment in regarding uh, what, regarding stones. Another aspect is uh, safety, and a third aspect is probably um, uh, diagnostic accuracy. I would probably say so. These are the the broad fields. And regarding diagnostics, <clears throat> I mentioned it briefly. So there are uh, imaging modalities; they don't exist yet in the in the flexible. Um, single-use ureteroscopes in, in regarding uh, upper tract tumor identification, for example, that facilitates that. So I think um, that can be um, intensified, maybe, uh, the, the pro production in, in this regard. Um, other aspects, uh, the optics, of course, the visibility improved, I think, a lot. And um, I think there's still more improvement possible that could help. Then we have certain issues with um, the diameter. We can use smaller ureteral axis sheets, especially now with the smallest 7.5 French uh, flexible ureteroscope. So um, pre-stenting becomes probably less important. It will be uh, more acceptable for patients if we can perform these operations uh, possibly without stenting with improved disintegration devices. They come also adjunct to the smaller flexibles so that the, for example the new lasers uh, we can have a more effective dusting again less residual fragments again less stenting so these are all i think factors they we, we know about them and partly they exist but i think uh, they all of them can still be improved Okay, and my, my last question, Christian, is uh, regarding, you know, we have these two uh, kind of uh, uh, instruments, actually. We have the single use, we have reusable. Uh, we, are, we of course, we know that uh, single use is much better because it's a completely sterile uh, instrument. And I must say that we are not completely honest with our patients. Uh, when we are using the regular uh, endoscope versus the, the, the single use. So do you think that we will be able to proceed for a long time, uh, keeping both actually the, the, the reusable one and the single use, uh, single use one, or do you think that we will very quickly move for um, uh, exclusively uh, single use flexible I think I can talk for my uh, for, for our institution we 
actually completely change to single use scopes. Um, and I think the tendency, uh, the okay. development goes into that direction. Um, but there are factors they influence that decision, of course, which I mentioned and which will come in the in the next talks here. But I think at the moment the development goes into that direction. Yes. Okay, excellent. Very interesting to know that. Uh, thank you, Christian. It was a great talk again. Um, thank you. So Andrew. now it's time time to to move with uh, with uh, Dr. Guido Giusti from uh, Milano. I think. Guido needs absolutely no introduction, as uh, all of you. Uh, and Guido, you will uh, give us um, a talk regarding the, the new uh, single-use flexible uratoscope from Puzan, the new one, the 7.5 French. Guido. Guido, you are, you are mute, I think. Okay, yes. sorry, sorry. So, good morning, everybody. It is a, a great pleasure for me to be here in this webinar with such a distinguished panel, of course. And now I have the pleasure to address this topic about the characteristics of this brand new 7.5 thousand single use viewer telescopes. Before going into details, it's important to keep in mind, what do we want from a flexible Euro telescope? We want vision, a combination of these features, vision, maneuverability, small diameter scope, durability, and of course, last but not least, cost effectiveness. If you look to this first prototype of flexible Euro telescope, things that it dates back to the late 60s, it was before the semi-rigid advent of ureteroscopy. It was already a good view, a acceptable view scope, but without any count of maneuverability. So at the end, it was almost completely useless. And we had to wait at, uh, to, uh, to wait at least uh, two decades for the first generation of Stolz Flex 6 c in which they were able for the first time to add to a good vision, also a good <coughs> maneuverability. Then all the company were able to manufacture different, um, different model of single use fiber optic scope and all of them were able to open, let's say the era of a flexible ureteroscope because they were able to guarantee a good vision, a good maneuverability and also a small diameter that basically rendered all kinds of flexible ureteroscopy possible. Then there was the feeling that the vision was good, but for sure improvable. So the company were able to improve the quality of video by handing more fibers into the bundle. So they passed from less than 5,000 fiber optics to more than 5,000. And as you can see, the quality of vision improved Consequently, then last generation of fiber optic, actually they are able to put more than 8,000 fiber optic inside the bundle. But once for the first time, we saw the quality of a digital view. Of course, this was definitely a breakthrough because once you are used to such a good quality, it is not easy to go back to the fiber optic quality of vision. So, Basically, this was the first scope to be put on the market with a very good quality of vision. But this is a critical point. This is a good vision scope, but the year happened something that I didn't like a lot because to have a progress in terms of view, we have a regression in terms of diameter of the scope. And I think that this is an important point when we have a real progress is when a progress is in all fields, not a progress in one aspect and a regression in another aspect. So even though the quality of vision of this Olympus V was very good, but look at the diameter, 10.9, was a very big scope. So better vision, but the diameter was too big. That's why, for example, uh, Dr. Grasso, who is a, one of the kings of flexibility telescopy was not in love with this uh, first generation digital scope because he couldn't accept this uh, 
let's say, step back in terms of diameter. And he couldn't set to perform flexible retroscopy with such a big UA telescope. Then the evolution continued and all the companies were able to deliver good quality the digital reusable scope with small diameter. So as you can see, all the company were able to deliver very good vision, very good maneuverability scope, and also with acceptable small diameter scope. But then there was another problem to face, the fact that all these reusable scopes were very, very fragile and the durability has always been an issue. So again, I start to, uh, all the urologists started to have this feeling that maybe the, a real breakthrough could have been the introduction on single use ureteroscope. Again, in this, uh, in this field, there was, let's say, a strange progress because the concept was a step ahead, but this first generation uh, prototype of single use ureteroscope were not able to deliver a good maneuverability and also a not acceptable quality of vision. So again, a step ahead in terms of a concept, but a step back in, in, in terms of quality of vision. But we have to honestly to be thankful to Boston Scientific for the real breakthrough that they were able to deliver at more or less 2015 when they first introduced the lithoscope immediately after also put and put um, the first generation uh, use scope on the market. And so subsequently, all the other company went on the market. And actually, from this generation, they, we can say that all the reusable scope were able to deliver very high quality and similarly, similarly quality view from the scope. Because for example, if I ask you, doctor, to recognize which scope is uh, the one on the left and the one on the right is almost impossible. Uh, uh, as you can see, the quality of vision is very, very similar. So we can say that starting from this period where the companies were able to deliver a good vision and maneuverability single use scope, but again, there was another problem. These scopes were too big. Because if you compare all uh, the single use, the single use Euro telescope, you know, on, on the market up to now, when the fiber optic and uh, with their reusable counterpart, you can realize immediately that there is a significant discrepancy in terms of diameter in favor, of course, of reusable scope. But this problem, uh, we can say today that this problem has been definitely solved thanks to the introduction of this brand new 7.5 Euro telescope from Pusen, because as you, all of, uh, of us know, is a seven point French in diameter, which is actually the smallest scope on the market. And this is the most important feature that we are going to appreciate. Talking about the characteristic, first of all, packaging. This scope comes with an outer carton box, which is very small and which contains an inner blister, as you can see. And now let's try to recognize all the features of this blister. First, this is the certification that the sterilization of this, the scope has been perfect. Then there is also this label on both external and internal box in which we can recognize the expiration date, the reference number, and the type of deflection, reverse versus uh, logical American deflection. And last but not least, to keep in mind that this is a single user scope that should not be reprocessed. Uh, what I like a lot of this um, box is that it is very small compared to the competitors and it is very easy to, to find a place in our endourological chart in the OR. So it's very easy to have always this scope close by when you are operating in difficult endourological procedure. Talking about the monitor, there are, we have two options with this scope. We can connect this scope with the dedicated Pusen monitor 
that it comes with a, an eight gigabyte internal memory and it, has, it is uh, supplied with all the, the um, different connection available actually on the market so that you can operate like in this uh, picture, just watching the monitor or you can also connect the monitor to your standard endo urological tower. It's up to you whether you prefer to do in one way or in the other. Usually, I prefer this if I operate only with a flexible retroscopy, while I prefer the, uh, this other combination when I perform endoscopic combined intraanal surgery. The second option is to use only these image processors that is, uh, it will be available on the market very soon with similar characteristics. But the advantage of this is that it is very small and it is always very easy to find some room on our endoscopic tower in order to connect this image processor always with our endoscopic tower. So leaving some room, leaving some room in our OR because of course we don't need a second monitor to be connected. What about illumination? The innovation of this last generation 7.5 Prusen scope when compared to the first generation one is that the illumination comes with a double spot and this is supposed to deliver a better illumination reducing, reducing um, shadow RS that sometimes are a little bit a problem when um, for use uh, for single use scope when compared to a usable scope. What about the handle? The handle is a very ergonomic and um, it comes with two buttons and by pressing these two buttons you can control by yourself while you are operating in order to record pictures and video and of course this is a very useful uh, a very useful um, features that uh, for our educational activity and we have also a working channel with a lower lock connection where we can connect our irrigation system in which in this case is a Rokamed T-Flow system that is my favorite, but it is compatible with all kinds of irrigation system. Talking about the working channel, um, this um, uh, scope is supplied with one single working channel, 3.6 frames in size, like the majority of the scope on the market and the orientation of this working channel is three o'clock, as, as you can see from this picture. What about the deflection? As reported in the, in the brochure of the scope, the, the deflection is at uh, 270, 270 in both direction. And I can confirm that it is definitely true. I, will, I would say that it is even a little bit more than this. And um, as shown in this video, this deflection is more than enough to guarantee a complete navigation of the old, um, of all uh, upper track um, collecting system. And this is definitely a, an advantage of the scope because of course, um, when you have a such a robust and effective deflection, of course, uh, uh, the navigation of the entire collecting system is, uh, can be guaranteed. Another feature that is definitely in favor of um, uh, the new Cousin uh, 7.5 is it, its light weight. Because if you weigh this scope, you realize that it is less than 200 grams and it is much less than when compared to the Boston Little View. And of course, the difference is even bigger when you compare to standard usable scope. And as we have already heard in the, in the previous lecture, this is definitely an advantage, especially for long procedure where to hold the scope with the camera connect can be very, very uh, hard for a surgeon, especially if a surgeon, for example, is a female like my colleague, Dr. Proietti. And also the dimension uh, of the handle is uh, very ergonomic and suitable for all dimension hands of different surgeons. Well, talking about this uh, reduced diameter, of course, the advantage basically uh, is that it fits into all kinds of ureteral access sheet on the market. 
especially on the Cook 9.5 that is the smaller on the market. In this video is a Uretelax sheet from um, Rockamed, which is bigger than 9.5 because it is a little bit more than 10 frames, but it was clear that the outflow was always guaranteed during the surgery. And as you can see these, uh, as you, you might know, the, um, this good outflow is one of the, uh, the safety rule to perform a long surgery because only by doing this, you are sure that what you are introducing is also coming out, keeping the pressure under a safety pressure, I would say. What I like a lot of the first case that I performed with this 7.5 is that this very, very small uh, diameter scope allows you to incinerate the vast majority of the, the um, ureter directly with no guide wire, like in this video, is with a kind of no touch technique. And this is very, very, um, I would say, um, useful during the surgery. And actually has changed a little bit the practice in our department because also for flex ureteroscopy, we start directly with the single use ureteroscope we, uh, without using any longer the semi-rigid ureteroscope. And also this uh, good feature of this scope is changing also the way we treat uh, a stone in the ureter. Since it is so easy to get access to the ureter, Actually, with this scope, we are, we are treating also the vast majority of ureteric stone with the flexible ureteroscopy, just because it is very easy to entry the ureter, to go back, to remove fragment, as you see in this video. And I think that maybe another change in our practice uh, delivered by this scope could be also to treat the vast majority of ureteral stone by means of this uh, single-use flexible ureteroscope. And of course, in difficult ureters, this reduced diameter is another uh, useful uh, features. And uh, in, this, uh, in this difficult case, there was a, a difficult uh, stenosis. We can accelerate a little bit. And there was no way to uh, introduce a ureteral access sheet because of this structure, but by forcing a little bit, but most importantly, uh, using this uh, small scope, it was uh, possible to pass through this uh, structure and for sure it would not have been possible with a bigger diameter scope. Also in edges, of course, uh, is an advantage because uh, um, this is our preference to use a single use scope during this complicated procedure just to avoid to break uh, our reusable ureteral scope. So the definition uh, is um, good enough to perform a good surgery. Before I ask you to recognize a little view from the first generation view scope, and now I ask you to recognize the quality of vision before the first generation, the second generation uh, pools and scope, the new 7.5. And as you can see, the quality is just the same. So this is a, a great step I had in terms of reduction of the diameter of the scope, but keeping the same quality of definition. And this has been demonstrated also in this paper by Dr. Design from India that were able uh, to demonstrate that the quality of the scope is just the same, only this, the, the diameter of the scope is reduced. And this is definitely a step I had. If we want to find a drawback in this scope when compared to the competitors is that some competitors has a higher definition and higher definition uh, vision, but of course they come with a bigger diameter. So in conclusion, I would say that it was um, the, um, the reduction in diameter of our scope was the most urgent need for the modern endourologist. And we have to be thankful for, uh, to Kuzen for this innovation, because I do think that sometimes a little lower definition, but with a, a very close view can be better than a higher definition view, but from very far behind, because we, you were not able to get into the TV. So I thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Guido. Um, it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, description of this uh, new uh, 7.5 uh, uh, single-use flexible Eurotask app. I think uh, uh, all the characteristics, you, you very well describe all the, the characteristics and the, the differences actually regarding the, the, the different uh, scopes uh, available. Just two quick questions, uh, uh, Guido. Uh, the first one yes. is, we, we, we said for, uh, we still say that um, fiber optic and the scope, uh, there's still a place uh, just because they are smaller than the, the regular digital one. And this is one of the recommendations actually, actually to keep fiber optic and the scope due to the small size. It seems today that uh, with the introduction of the, this uh, new Puzen 7.5 French, that these uh, advantage uh, will disappear. So do you think actually that uh, this is definitively the end of fiber optic? Since now we have a digital one uh, and, and as small as the, the fiber optic one. Well, Olivier, it's difficult to say whether it will kill fiber optic. I think that it is going to be very, very likely because actually uh, then this a very reduced diameter guarantee the navigation in the vast majority of, uh, of um, collecting system. Maybe the deflection of the very terminal part of uh, the scope can be still a little bit in advantage of a fiber up the scope. But I think that this is not going to be enough to keep our uh, fiber up the scope. Honestly, Olivier, I don't know about you, but actually I'm using fiber up the scope very, very rarely. And I ask only my young colleague to use them. Actually, I use only digital. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's we have this, the same experience. And, and my second uh, question, uh, Guido, for you, uh, you, you mentioned that now you are able with this uh, 7.5, you are able to uh, uh, treat uh, ureteral stones, um, meaning probably that you are not using so much uh, semi-rigid or rigid ureteral scalp. But my question is regarding more uh, emergency, uh, ureteroscopy that we can perform in emergency, you know? We have to drain patient by placing double G for some uh, uh, renal colic in emergency. Do you think today that unless we place a double G, we can maybe imagine to place directly a 7.5 flexi uh, ureteroscope and to treat the stone and not place a stand and to wait uh, for the treatment of the stone? Uh, you are definitely right, because if we think it over, the dimension of this scope is more or less the dimension of a stand. So for sure, this is um, really possible. And actually, uh, as you might know, we, we move to the main San Rafael Hospital. Now we have a first aid section. So this is very important to have this new possibility, also because when we operate in the emergency OR, we have just to bring our single use scope, our little monitor, and also for the uh, nurse team of the emergency OR is uh, much, much easier to assist us when compared to a standard endoscopic tower. So this is definitely a possibility in the future. And again, we have to be thankful to Kuzen who have developed such a small diameter scope. Okay, thank you, Guido. Again, uh, thank excellent you. Thank talk. You. So we can move for the, 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 the next talk with uh, Dr. Lopez Martinez from Spain, uh, from Barcelona. And uh, we will uh, discuss now the, the place of uh, single use uh, of flexible ureteroscope and renal abnormalities. As for a long time, we, we recommend to use a single use to preserve uh, the regular scope since uh, uh, renal abnormalities is uh, a challenging situation. Okay. Okay. Good morning. Okay. Do you see my screen? Good morning. Firstly, uh, I would like to thank the organizer of this meeting for, for their invitation and all the colleagues that are con connected for their attention. Uh, now we are going to talk about flexible ureteroscopy in patients with renal abnormalities. 
since uh, its first use, flexible ureteroscopes are increasing their popularity due to constantly technological improvements. Uh, currently, uh, the European Guidelines of Urology recommends flexible ureteroscopy as first or second line therapy for almost all, ki uh, all kidney stones, according to the stone burden and the localization of this stone. Uh, that's why more than 30% of currently kidney stone surgeries are performed with flexible scopes. But furthermore, uh, there is uh, um, an increase uh, of use of, of those instruments for the diagnosis and the treatment of a very urothelial carcinoma. So the number of procedures and indication of use are increasing constantly. Uh, we can find different flexible scopes in the market. For practical reason, we can divide the flexible scopes in three groups, fiber optic uh, flexible scopes, digital scopes, and single use, which can be said to be a, a concrete type of, of digital scope. The decision to use one modality of a scope or another should be held based on four different characteristics. There are um, uh, some technical aspects uh, we, we have to keep in mind in order to decide which flexible scope I am going to use for a concrete surgery. Firstly, uh, quality of vision is better in those scopes with digital camera, but uh, fiber optical scopes on the other hand are thinner. Usually digital scopes diameter is bigger than HRR and we can find in the market uh, fiber optic scopes smaller than HRR. This smaller diameter provide better outflow of the irrigation with the same working channel. And this characteristic decrease intrarenal pressures in procedures when a small fiber optic uh, scope is used. Also, then tip deflection has been shown to be better in flexible, in flexible scopes. So according to those technical aspects, um, we will base uh, the decision to use one type of scope or another for a concrete surgery. But also this decision must be held uh, according to the cost of uh, the procedure. According to, to the literature, the cost associated to the flexible scope are related to the sterilization process, the storage, and the repair of uh, the scopes uh, after clinic, uh, critical damages during uh, surgeries. Challenging situations like the treatment of lower pole stones are known to be risky procedures increasing the risk of scope uh, damage during the deflect, uh, due to the deflection need to arise the stone and the risk of damaging the working channel when introducing instruments uh, with, uh, through the scope in this position. So we, we can say that there is an increased risk of damaging the scope in procedures uh, with increased angle of the ureter and, uh, narrow, uh, and when, when narrow ureters are, are present. And this is just, uh, and or we can say that uh, it, it is just in cases of treating a patient with renal abnormalities, like congenital uh, abnormalities or urinary diversions, in which we will uh, find challenging situation, increasing the risk of damaging our scope and potentially increasing signif significantly uh, the cost of the, of the procedures. Um, we have to, uh, and also we, we have to keep in mind uh, what we have said uh, during the introduction of this talk. Nowadays, there is an increase uh, in the number of flexible procedures in patients with upper urothelial carcinoma, and some of those patients uh, will have a urinary diversion like ileal conduct or neobladder, which will increase the difficulty of these procedures and the risk of damaging the flexible, the flexible scope. So when treating uh, patients uh, with renal abnormalities, we will face difficulties like urethral anastomosis with narrower urethral lumens and challenging insertion of this anastomosis in the neobladder or the ileal conduit. In addition, intrarenal pressure is even more important in those uh, procedures due to the increased risk of sepsis in patients with urinary diversion and the potential risk of tumor seeding in fornic structures if it occurs uh, when treating an upper urethelial carcinoma. 
So single use flexible scope will be ideal, uh, an ideal scope when treating patients with renal abnormalities due to, to the increased risk of uh, critical damage of the scope. But a smaller diameter will be disabled for increasing the uh, urethral insertion ratio, which is known to be better in thinner uh, scopes. And, with, uh, uh, and, and also we need an improvement in the irrigation outflow um, and it can be achieved with a reduction uh, of the diameter of the scope because it reduces intrarenal pressure. And as we have already said, it decreases the risk of sepsis and tumor seeding. Uh, and all this uh, will be desirable uh, to be with uh, a better quality of vision uh, using a digital camera. So the perfect flexible scope for treating those patients will be a single-use flexible scope with a small uh, caliber. Now I am going to show you some clips of challenging situation we must face uh, when treating patients with urinary depression. In this first clip, we can see uh, a favorable insertion of the left ureter in an ileal conduit, but a really narrow anastomosis of the right ureter, which requires a small caliber instrument. Here you see the, the left ureter uh, anastomosis. In the second clip, uh, a Wallace type reimplant is shown, uh, and also the lumen uh, of this anastomosis is wide enough. The insertion angle impede a, a correct entry of the ureteroscope. You can see the, the urethral lumen, but it is impossible to, to entry through the, the lumen. So um, a guide wire had to be used to overpass the anastomosis with the risk of damaging the, the scope with this maneuver. In, in this other case, we will see an ileal conduit with the insertion of the ureter more angle. The entry to the ureter was impossible due to this angle, so an anterograde guide wire was placed and removed with an ethanol basket through the ileal conduit to be used to, to, for a retrograde insertion of the flexible scope. Uh, this is another maneuver that, maneuver that put in risk the flexible scope again um, in order to be able to entry to the upper uh, urinary system. That's the, the remove of the, of the guide wire in order to be used to, to put the flexible scope in a retrograde uh, direction. In this, uh, this is another example of challenging uh, urethral anastomosis due to, to the insertion uh, the, the angle of the insertion of the ureter in a, in a patient with a neobladder. Uh, on the CT scan, uh, we can see a, a, a suspicious lesion in the uh, upper calyx. The left ureter anastomosis is situated in, an, in the anterior aspect of the neobladder, of the neobladder as you, can, you have already seen in the CT scan. And this localization make uh, totally impossible the insertion of the flexible scope and also make impossible the insertion of a straight or a curved guide wire through the ureter, as you will see. That's the straight guide wire, and it was impossible to, to place it through the, through the ureter, and neither with the curved guide wire. So again, um, an anterograde uh, guide wire was placed in order to uh, be used to put the, um, the flexible scope in a retrograde manner. Yeah, you see the anterograde guide wire is removed through the urethra. And then we use this guide wire in order to push the flexible scope up to the upper urinary tract. Here we are. Finally, we will see an example of surgery in a congenital abnormality. In the CT scan, we can see a right cross renal ectopia 
and abnormal rotation of the left kidney. Upper urinary calyx stone was found in the left kidney with an unfavorable anatomy for a percutaneous procedure. And due to the, to the narrow lumen of the ureter that you will see, this is the, the ureteral meatus, and it, the patient had a, a really narrow ureteral lumen. So the fiber optic flexible scope was used. Uh, also, all the stone was, uh, was removed uh, with the flexible scope, and it was quite comfortable because it was in the upper calyx. The complexity uh, anatomy uh, of the calycial system put in risk of damaging the scope when checking uh, the, uh, the residual fragments in the uh, whole collecting system. So a smaller diameter flexible single scope will be perfect uh, for this uh, procedure, but uh, with the risk of damaging it um, due to the, the, this anatomy. So as a conclusion, the ideal flexible ureter scope in challenging anatomies like renal abnormalities should be a small diameter scope to increase the insertion ratio and decrease the intrarenal pressure with a standard working channel, with a, a digital camera uh, and optimal irrigation in order to provide quite, well, good quality of vision. And it should be a single use flexible scope to avoid the increment of cost of the procedure due to the critical damage of the scope during those, those procedures. So thank you very much for, for, for your attention. And if you have any question, please let me, let me know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your beautiful video. Even the sun was not uh, all the time. Uh, Sorry, uh, because uh, when perfect. we check it, okay. it the, the, the audio was OK. Yeah, Sorry. sure. But I think we, we were able to, uh, to follow perfectly on on your on your videos and, and, and the slides it was okay no, no worries um, just you know quick comment um, I must say that um, when I discussed with my colleagues regarding the choice uh, for single use you know most of the people are very impressed by the quality of vision and, and this is uh, what we demonstrate easily to, to, to tell some people look at my picture this is a very good quality and we must say that most of the time, uh, the quality is okay, uh, it's good, sometimes excellent, but this is not really the point. I think the, the, the most important recommendation we have to give to the colleagues is to look about the, the resistance of, of these uh, single-use endoscope, uh, because the problem is that when the people are using single-use, you know, they are, they are feeling that um, this is single-use, so they don't care so much when they are forcing scarps into the collecting system. When you are using reusable scarp, you care about your scarp because you know that if you force, you will break it and then this is a, a disaster. But when people are using, I can see that when the people are using the single use, they are really forcing much more. So I think this is also a general comment we need to tell the people, yes, you can force, probably a little bit more, but don't force too much. E e even, I, I have no idea about what is too much, but I think that's something we need really to, uh, to, uh, to, to tell uh, the colleagues. So my questions for you is regarding this new Puzen 7.5, because you already tested. it. Uh, so I would like to know from you, what is your experience regarding the resistance of these new scars? Because it's, it's much smaller. So maybe it's uh, more fragile. So what is your experience? Well, firstly, uh, I would say that we, we have to be very gentle when we are performing a flexible ureteroscopy, not only for the scope, but also for the, the patient. For, because if, if we make any uh, movement um, uh, with uh, more strength or, or too, too hard, we can damage the ureter and, and it will be a, a big problem. So it's not only for the, for the scope, it's also for the patient. Um, on the other hand, uh, in the cases I have performed, I have already performed with uh, the new Pusen scope, I had the, the impression that it has, um, 
it was as good a, as the previous uh, version of, of this scope. It was thinner, but I didn't have the feeling that it could break uh, more easily than, than the previous version or than a reusable re scope. Uh, so in my opinions, you don't have to, to push or you don't have to, to make different movements uh, with uh, single use or a reusable in order to, to keep safe the to give the safety to for the patient and uh, concrete with this uh, scope I, I don't feel it's it's uh, a soft or a weak uh, uh, instrument okay and just a very quick question um, so if you have a case with a, a renal abnormalities in your practice do you immediately select uh, the single use or do you still start to do it with the regular stop and if you feel that it becomes more and more difficult, you stop and then you switch for the single use. Usually, uh, when you see a CT scan and you see the renal anatomy, you can uh, almost think if it will be a challenging case or not. Uh, if, uh, for example, the, 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 the case I, I have shown of the patient with the neobladder, uh, we were sure that it was going to be a challenging case. Uh, it was, uh, six months ago, so I didn't have uh, this new push and flexible scope. I had to use uh, my regular scope, my reusable scope. Um, but for sure, nowadays I will use a, a single use one uh, with a small caliber in order to reduce the risk of breaking the, the, the scope, but also due to the caliber of this scope. Because um, with this new scope, we have the possibility to have a digital vision, a digital camera with a small diameter which is really interesting for upper urothelial carcinoma. I fully agree with you. Uh, I think now we can, we can take the benefit of small size, digital view, and single use in case of uh, any breakage. Thank you so much uh, for your excellent presentation. And since we are running late a little bit, I would like to switch for my, my very good friend, uh, Dr. Bashkar Somani. Uh, very nice to see you, Bashkar. And uh, you will talk about um, uh, single-use flexible ureteroscopy for children. Even we know that it's not a, a very frequent situation, but children are very demanding. Uh, so uh, we listen to you, Bashkia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Olivier. It's a real pleasure for me to be here uh, amongst a lot of endurologists I've always looked up to. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you, Pearson, for this. Uh, I have been doing pediatric ureteroscopy for last 10, 11 years, and I have to say, it is uh, challenging, not just because of the size, but also you have uh, you know, the, the compromise. The, the kids can decompensate quickly. You have the parents, and the decision-making is also quite important. So far, there is no obvious study on single use in children. So I'm going to share my experience. This is my conflict of interest. So looking at the guidelines, the EAU guidelines, you know, the indications for ch children are very similar to adults. Ureteral stones under one centimeter, you have lithotripsy with ureteroscopy as an alternative. And renal stones, uh, again, up to two centimeter, you have lithotripsy with ureteroscopy as an alternative. And large stones, of course, we all agree that PCNL is better. Uh, it's important in pediatric to offer metabolic evaluation in, and especially to try and analyze the stone. Now, for flexibility retroscopy, particularly, the stone free rate is reasonably good. Retreatment rates can vary up to 20%. Complications generally have come down and they are minor if they are. But they're especially useful for low pool stones with unfavorable anatomy and the failure predisposing factors for failure are young age, cysteine stones, large stones, and lack of pre-stenting. And that's where I think the smaller uh, single use scope comes in because you don't have to always pre-stent and you can get up probably easier in younger children. And compared to PNL, yes, the stone tree rate is slightly lower, although you can stage the procedure, but you have less radiation, complication rates are lower, and of course, a shorter hospital stay. So worldwide, we know that the trend of ureteroscopy is increased and lithotripsy has come down and it's the same in children. And when we look at the publication trends, it shows the same. Ureteroscopy and minimally invasive PCNL have really taken up even in pediatric patients. 
So looking at our own data, bearing in mind, we, we, we didn't have a small enough single use scope so far. So I have tried to use it, but even that slight increase in diameter, I've so far used reusable scopes, but going forward, I would be uh, using the, the 7.5 piece in scoop. So we had 81 patients with 102 procedures with a mean age of about nine years and a stone size of nine millimeters. Location mostly in the kidney of which most in the lower pool as you would expect. Multiple stones in more than a quarter of patients. The pre-op stenting, we get patients from a wide area, almost 200 to 250 miles. So some of them are pre-stented before they're referred. The post-op stenting rates are generally lower than what you would expect in adults. And we are not afraid to use access sheets, uh, but I try and use the smallest possible, which is the 9.5, 11.5. And this is the key, the, the stone tree rate, the final stone tree rate. Some patients did have a second procedure, but uh, was quite good in complication rates. We had one sepsis and respiratory issue and two UTIs. But this I think is the, the, the key point the ureteroscopy in pediatric patients is now very safe. In fact, I, I hope that in time we see them uh, poised equally with lithotripsy when it comes to pediatric stones in the guidelines. And how do we do it? We have a twin surgeon model, and I think I'm not good in looking after kids because that is not my bread and butter. So we pair up with pediatric urologists and we jointly discuss these cases, we plan them. Uh, they're seen and managed by the pediatric urologist before and after because they have a team of pediatric nurses and, and the whole team who are used to looking after children. We do the procedures jointly. And as I said, it's an excellent outcome. And I know a lot of UK centers and European centers are adopting this model. So looking at the use of access sheet, because this is something we have talked about. Recently, we have teamed up with Spain and this is our results for 48 patients using access sheet in pediatric patients. Uh, Generally speaking, you know, the mean stone burden was more than one and a half centimeters, so large stones, and a third of them were also multiple stones. Uh, we, again, we use the 9.5, 11.5 access sheet across both centers. I'm hoping with the 7.5 scope, these sheet size can come down further. Now, when we look at the surgical outcomes, uh, again, the stone tree rate, you know, although some patients needed a second procedure, the stone tree rate was 100%, and the complication rate has really gone down. There was one minor ureteric injury and there was one UTI, but really more than that, all patients had good outcomes. So I think if you need to use access sheets, especially for large stones in pediatrics, don't be afraid, provided you are safe and careful. Going forward, what about the long-term effect on pediatric access sheet? You know, we don't know, we are always worried. Could there be stricture formation? So we looked at our series of 21 patients. This was published a few years ago now with a mean age of 12 years. And again, reasonably large stones, access sheet, as I said, this is what I've used. Uh, the the, the pre-op stent rate was low and the complications, we had zero complication in this and one patient wasn't stone free. And this was over a period of two, just over two years in a mean follow-up. So I think the risk of stricture formation, and I know from Prof Trax's data as well, it's quite low, even with, Complications. So without complications, if you have not had a electric injury, that risk is minimal, really. And we didn't find any strictures. What about comparison with other forms of treatment like mini PCNL? We compared our central, the specializing in electroscopy versus a central in India, who specialize in mini PCNL for pediatrics with comparable patients. They had slightly higher stone size, but we had more multiple stones. But overall, the, the you know, the, the details in terms of stenting, nephrostomy, et cetera, the similar stone tree rate, 100% for us, 97.5, 97% for them. Complication rates, again, slightly higher for mini PCNL, but they were all minor. So overall, there's no difference. And that landscape will change further if we had smaller scopes, for sure. Looking at uh, ureteroscopy for stone disease, what is the watershed? This is a very important paper and a table Six years seems to be the watershed. If the patients are over the age of six years, the failure to access rate is much smaller and the complication rates are less than a third. So what if we had a smaller scope? The failure to access rate will improve. You can do primary retroscopy. The complication rates, for sure, because a lot of these uh, mucosal aberrations and so on will come down. So again, there is a good argument to be using uh, the smaller diameter single-use scopes for these patients. 
what about lower pool students we know that you know they are almost in parallel with uh, with adult in the adult literature this is a recent paper again uh, in two european centers looking at lower pool students uh, we had 57 patients uh, with a mean age of about 10 years uh, again about a third of them had multiple stones. Uh, this is important because, again, not everybody needs pre-stenting. About a third were pre-stented. And uh, some of the post-op stents was either a, a stent or an open-ended geotelic catheter overnight. Access sheet we used more often in this cohort. Uh, the stone tree rate, again, was quite good. You have to warn the patients or the parents in this case about a need for stage procedures sometimes and the complications related to four urinary tract infections. And I think, again, for low pool students in pediatrics, especially if the scoop size, as uh, my friend Yudub has showed, so the small size, it's easier to deflect, it's easier, and probably it'll be easier to navigate. So I think, again, the feature of low pool students with smaller scoops would be, would be a lot better. Now, this paper has already been mentioned by Yudub, but I think this is the only one that compares the small size uh, piece and scope to the standard size. Uh, and they had 15 patients in both arm, smaller access sheet for the, for the smaller scope. But there was no difference in terms of vision and maneuverability. They were very similar. And I think the advantage with the small size would be that you can introduce them through smaller access sheet. And the vision, deflection, and the ability to maneuver is very similar. So again, why use a bigger size if you can do the same job with a smaller size, which has an advantage of less mucosal trauma or more primary retroscopy. Uh, totally fluoroless is something that has been published from Spain. I don't particularly practice this in pediatric patients, but I think if you're good in ultrasound or you've got access to it, you might do it. I feel a bit nervous. I always like to see when the access sheet is going past the uretric orifice and around the UPJ, but they have got indications for when they would use fluoro, but otherwise, they have said, uh, Emiliani and Anna Bajons, that you can do it fluoroless. And if you can do it safely, then why not do it in pediatric patients and minimize radiation dose further? What about a combination of uh, like an Isiris, a mini PCNL and a bit flexi -URS? Again, this is the only paper I could find and you could potentially do it. And the advantage of small scope is you can combine them with micro PNL or mini PNL uh, and, and, and treat multiple stones. Although I have to say the indications for SRS in my view for pediatric patients would be very, very limited uh, and probably not as justified as in adult patients. Uh, and this is something that probably is best served for multiple students. Although if you've got a smaller scope then, and you can access it, again, you can treat them through, uh, through the urethroscope itself. Uh, this is something that people talk about with what is, should be the size of a volume, who should be doing pediatric students. And they looked at medium and high volume centers, and we defined medium volume as between 25 to 50 cases, which they were reported and high volume is over 50 cases. And actually there was no difference in these medium and high volume cases. And urethroscopy was safe and effective in both of these groups. Clearly, if you're a low volume center, you should be referring them on to a more experienced center. Uh, but if you do a, a reasonable number of pediatric cases, because it's not just the surgical ability. It's also looking the, after the patients before and afterwards. And that's why I think the volume is important and teaming up with the pediatric colleagues is also important. The high powered laser, there's the worry about, uh, you know, temperature and so on. And we looked at the dusting and pop dusting using a high powered laser. And actually, you know, with dusting and pop dusting, you start with dusting uh, and then you move on to, to pop dusting. So start with the dusting setting, go on to pop dusting setting. And even though this was a small series, we didn't find any complication and there was no issue. Clearly we didn't measure the temperature and that is something I hope uh, the modern generation single use scopes can incorporate how to measure pressure and temperature at the same time. So 10 years ago, I thought, well, I can't do it. It's really difficult, but actually you can. And how do I do it? You have an up-to-date culture, ultrasound imaging. We predominantly use ultrasound for all the pediatric patients before and after. Antibiotic prophylaxis guided by culture or as per your protocol on the resistant patterns. Initial cystoscopy and safety wear. And I always, always do a semi-rigid with the needle scope. And, and that is because you can calibrate the urethra, passively dilate it, and you can see whether an access sheet will go. And if so, 
only then use an access sheet. Otherwise, you can do a, a railroad with a primary retroscope. Access sheet is always for us is the smallest available. And so far we have used a reusable scope, but um, we are planning a study with the 7.5 French uh, piercing scope. And I hope that changes the landscape for pediatric as well as you know, the difficult urethros going forward, even in adults. And always in pediatric, keep the irrigation pressure as low as you can and the operative time as, as low as possible. I think these two are fundamental. Overnight, we, we tend not to do it in day cases and keep them overnight, but most of our patients go home the following morning. So where, where is the role, I think, of single small use electroscopy? I think smaller scopes leads to less pre-stenting for sure, less, you know, uh, more primary electroscopy, less post-op stenting, higher success in pediatric patients. And then I think if they're single use and readily available, even with centers who don't do it that often, probably are going to start doing it. But you need to be doing a certain volume uh, of these cases. Uh, I have I've used it in adult cases, in a very difficult adult case, and it went really well. The, the, the characteristics have been beautifully covered by Guido, so I'm not going to go into that, but I think there is definitely a shift towards smaller scopes with this in market, and it will drive probably technological advancements further with uh, smarter scopes, which can monitor pressure or irrigation uh, or temperature. So I've used it. It was very comfortable. I agree. It's very lightweight. And it doesn't, once you're doing it, it doesn't feel any different with any of the other scopes. Uh, thank you very much. And looking forward to the questions. Thank you, Bashkar, for this beautiful overview regarding pediatric and flexi. This is not so common. We don't do so much. I think you, you, you made a, a very important comment, this collaboration with uh, the pediatric surgeons. Uh, in many countries, uh, adult uh, urologists, they cannot treat uh, uh, stones from, from the children. They need to collaborate. That's exactly what we do in our country. And I think it's very important to have this collaboration. You clearly mentioned, uh, Bashka, that um, uh, this uh, technique is feasible um, for children, but we need to adapt a little bit what we do uh, in uh, adults. I think it's important to know that and to mention what you did uh, really uh, beautifully. My question, Bashka, is for a long time, you know, we, we had to make a choice between shockwave lithotripsy and PCNL, or mini PCNL maybe, now we have fantastic instruments like the, these uh, single user scopes, 7.5, uh, meaning that we can place these endoscope uh, in uh, all uh, children, more or less. So what is actually the, the criteria uh, in terms of selection for you going for shockwave lithotripsy first or going for a flexi first? I think that's a beautiful question, Olivia. And to be honest, I think more than the choice of technique, what is your central good at? You know, what is the strength of your central? Where is most experience in your central? And this is a particular area where rather than quoting guidelines to the patient, you need to look at your own outcome and your own data. And that paper we did with the Indian colleagues, that showed it beautifully. They were very good in mini PCNL, and they, they, that was their go-to instrument. We were good in urethroscopy, and in one of the talks, we said, why don't we look at our data as individually and compare it? I do think, having said that, if the same logic, if you are a patient, you know, do you want a PCNL or do you want a urethroscopy? Now, clearly, you want a better stone clearance, no doubt about it. But it's the, the, the if you do a good PCNL, the, it's fine, but the chances of major complication with PCNL is always going to be slightly higher than the chances of major complication with the ureteroscopy. For two reasons. One, if the ureter is really tight, you can always stent and come back. And that option isn't really there with the PCNL if you're committed to it. And secondly, with the smaller scopes, the initial problem in pediatric was access. You know, a lot of time there's failure to access. With smaller scope, that problem isn't really there. The failure to access is, is quite easy or much easier. And then when you are inside, it is not, it is like doing an adult urethroscopy. So in my mind, if the guidelines say they are similar in adults, why should they be any different in pediatric? That's number one. Number two, in pediatric patients, you have to put them for a general anesthetic usually anyway, to give shock of lithotripsy. 
if you're going to put them for a general anesthetic, would you want a few sessions under general anesthetic or do you, would you want one, maximum two sessions of general anesthetic and make them stone free? So if I was a patient, you know, or if it was my child, I would want one or two sessions, but then they are stone free. You don't have this ambiguity and uncertainty of whether they are going to be stone free or not. So I think flexi ureteroscopy is probably, as it has become more safer, is probably going to match and probably supersede uh, lithotripsy, even in pediatric patients. Yeah, thank you, Bashkar. I think that's exactly what we can, uh, all of us, we can, we can see uh, that we're going more and more for flexi for not only adults, but also uh, in, in children, that's true. Um, okay, so let's move uh, with the, the next talk. Uh, I think there's no need to uh, introduce uh, Professor Vangelos Yatsikas. Uh, you know that uh, um, he's uh, the chairman of the European School of Urology, the new chairman of European School of Urology. Um, and we have seen uh, in, in the last 20, 20 years, uh, amazing new development in terms of uh, endourology and mainly regarding flexible ureteroscopy. So now, um, um, Evangelos, you will tell us uh, what we can expect more uh, regarding uh, single-use flexi uh, URS. Thank you, Olivier. Um... So I will try, even though a lot of what I'm going to say is, you know, we have a lot of talks and uh, inavoidably uh, there will be overlaps with other uh, presentations, but the concept is to see uh, why and what is the market for single use flexible ureteroscopy nowadays. And, uh, you know, we have always, all of us have been trained and have been uh, developing our expertise with the, uh, with the reusable scopes. And we started many years ago by using reusable scopes that were fiber optic and it was terrible and we were struggling. And uh, uh, we would have never imagined that after not so many years, the development of the image and of the vision that we have right now would be so good. And uh, this is clearly um, something that we all need to keep in mind that if the development of the past 10 years has been so drastic. I don't even imagine how the development of the next 10 years will be in all this that we're discussing about. So uh, as a starter, I would say that clearly the, the, the multi-use scopes are much more expensive. Uh, they, if they break, they're very costly. And I we all know that we all have residents, we all have fellows, that if your fellow, if, if your nurse calls you and tells you that uh, your fellow or your resident broke your scope, and this is a, a, a multi-use digital scope, you really go crazy because it, it is a big expense and it really means that you will have to spend a lot of money to get another one. Uh, sterilization concept is a concept clearly, uh, especially I would say, you know, the, the world is not a common market. So we have the US, we have France, we have Germany, but we have also Eastern Europe, we have Asia. We have a lot of places that sterilization is not the number one point, but cost is the number one point. So the market, um, if you see it as a marketing perspective, clearly sterilization is something that is a very hot topic for certain countries, but not so much for other countries. So the, the, it's a balance of reusable scopes, cost and sterilization issues. And uh, uh, also uh, this needs to be evaluated. When can a single use uh, scope be used? And we've all, we heard all the speakers and we heard everyone discuss about it. Clearly a scope can be used in all cases. There's no limitation for a single use scope, even better. Uh, that you can you can do more demanding cases because if it breaks, you know it breaks and the cost is low. Uh, clearly, the big benefit for me is that with a single use scopes, you will get a lot more people doing flexible ureteroscopy. A lot more people will learn how to do single use. All my residents, for example, now are doing flexible ureteroscopy. Before, I admit, I admit that the residents were learning. Bef they were learning first PCNL. And then they were learning flexible ureteroscopy because I could not afford to let them break a digital scope. So uh, this is for me a key point for all this. 
because really, uh, if they break a single use scope, they broke a single use scope, it costs you 800 euros, it costs you 600 euros, whatever, and that's it. And we can afford that. So for me, the biggest benefit of the single use scopes is not sterilization, which is a big plus. Yes, I admit it. Uh, it is the widespread use to everyone, uh, to everyone, and it makes teaching easier for us. And it makes the spread of this technique much more efficient and fast. This is very important. If we go back to history, we all have to um, give credit to Boston Scientific that it, they started with this concept because they were the first to start. They were criticized also in the beginning, um, but then as life always does, there was competition appearing and then the prices went down and now we have reached a very nice level of very economically uh, you know, acceptable presence of uh, single use scopes out there in the market. Uh, many studies have been showing that, uh, you know, have been trying to compare the list of you, which was, you know, the, the, the first in, in the group with the others. And clearly uh, all the scopes became better and better and better. We saw scopes that were terrible, like the Plexor view, for example, in the beginning, but all that is good because it helps development. It helps develop Competition between companies really helps development of everything. And when there was uh, clearly studies evaluating uh, single use and reusable scopes, because the first question was, what do I do now? How do I, do I use a single use or a reusable scope? It, it appeared clearly, and you don't need a lot of science to understand this, that at least for stones, we're not talking about tumors now, but for stones, the... Uh, the rates for the stone free rates and the, the outcomes were the same. There's no reason why they shouldn't be the same uh, exactly and with, a, with uh, no more complications. In fact, actually, one would, would think that with a single use scope, you would do more demanding cases and you would have more complications, but it never showed out in the literature. Cost is a very important issue, especially for certain markets, including the market where I live and where I'm, when I'm working. And, and we need also to uh, keep in mind that even though it is a single use scope in real life, and we need to say these things, you know, in real life in certain countries, it is not used, the, the single use scopes are not used as single use scopes. This is why the companies also have limited their time, their lifetime. This is why you have a limited lifetime because you would never do a flexible ureteroscopy for four hours. So why would a company limit the, the, the lifetime of, this, of the light? Because people use it for more, more time. So it is clear that cost is a major issue that drives this business. Major issues that drive this business. And clearly, uh, if you compare the costs, there is no relation, especially in place in, in, in centers that are not high volume centers, there is no comparison. Private practice the same. In private practice, a lot of doctors go and do cases that do not have experience with flexible ureteroscopy. And the, the, the rate of breaking a scope is so high that if we're reading in papers that in centers, in, in very you know, well-equipped uh, uh, centers, the breaking rate of a scope would be something like 60, 70, eight cases uh, per scope, per uh, multi-use scope. In private practice, I don't know in your countries, but in my countries, in my country, scopes used to break after five or six or seven uses because people didn't know how to use them. So cost is a huge aspect. Now, technical details uh, about the new 7.5. Uh, Guido showed them very nicely. The big advantage of this is that, you know, in life, uh, not everything uh, goes according to one theory. So there are certain topics, size matters. But in this case, Size matters in a, in a, in a contrary uh, manner. So the smaller, the better. Uh, in this case, in life, not always the smaller, the better. But in this case, it is. Why? It is clear. It is clear because you can go and you adapt the instrument to the ureter. So in the future, I think that companies will try to go even smaller. And the vision and the chip technologies will probably allow them to do this. Uh, so the big novelty of, uh, of reducing the, the scope size, which is something really important, is that you can respect more the anatomy 
by not decreasing the quality of the image and the irrigation. So I think this is very important. Um, you can, once you're in, you don't realize that you have a smaller scope. I tried a couple of times to go in without a wire. And I must say that in uh, men that have a big prostate and I have to lever, I had some problems. So I not always managed to go in without a wire. And in very narrow ureters, even over a wire, sometimes I've had an issue to push it up. Uh, but again, it's such a small uh, device that uh, most of the times it can go up over a wire. So I am a big fan of decreasing size. And I think, I personally think that in the future, we will decrease, decrease size even more. So this is a, a beginner, this is the first step, but I'm sure that we will see more. And uh, we will see more of decreased sizes. We will see more of adapting new technology on single use scopes, because as very well Olivier said, we have a couple of questions that when we're doing flexible ureteroscopy are not met. The answer, we don't have answers to what kind of pressures we're generating, and we don't have answers on what kind of temperatures we're generating. We have studies, we have bench studies, we have animal studies, we have clinical studies with ways that we are thinking of calculating the temperatures, but we don't have scopes yet that have pressure sensors and temperature sensors. And I know that probably this will come out on reusable scopes, uh, and then it would justify the difference of cost of a scope like this. But my vision for the future would be to have a single use scope that would give me features like this at a reasonable cost, because this in reality is the only problem of flexible ureteroscopy. What kind of damage you are creating potentially without even getting to know it. So clearly there have been publications regarding this uh, decreased size scope and uh, it seems that the, 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 the results are comparable and clearly the benefit is that you decrease the access sheet if you want to place an access sheet. So the size of the access sheet can be further decreased, meaning that you, you can really decrease the damage, the potential damage to the ureter and or you don't need to pre-stent if you don't want. So uh, this is a big advantage and it doesn't take a lot to compare the two scopes with each other. You see visually there is a difference so you you also notice it with the eye that there is a difference most of the times when you're comparing such a small number of friends diameters you don't realize the difference but in this case uh, it is clear that the 7.5 to the 9.2 you see the difference there is no reduction in flexibility so they have managed to decrease the size without decreasing the quality of the image of the deflection and of all the movements that you can do. So really it's, it's a scope that I think is going to pave the way, is going to create a pathway for further development uh, because everyone was, uh, was moving ahead towards making the image better. So this scope really uh, creates a pathway to decrease the size without decreasing the qualities of what you're getting. And uh, again, it is a scope that uh, allows you to move inside the kidney very nicely. So it doesn't decrease maneuverability at all. It gives you the possibility of uh, being able to, uh, to go in, move in all calluses, uh, do everything that you used to do previously. And uh, the image is, is uh, more than acceptable, I would say, is fully comparable with uh, the, the, uh, the previous generation and, uh, and all the other single use scopes and if you're not treating tumors and you're treating stones because for tumors there is a debate i would say that uh, you know uh, it's more than efficient uh, to do a good uh, stone clearance job and uh, irrigation is good and everything so i think that the, the future of flexible ureteroscopy will clearly move to decreasing the size of a scope and uh, will will make things much better we will see in the next years, next couple of years, not so many, in the next couple of years, big developments because this is a huge market and there's, there's no discussion about it. The companies are investing in it. The doctors are giving their ideas and uh, this is how the whole thing is going to proceed. So um, having said this, concluding, uh, I would say that clearly uh, single um, uh, increased Single-use ureteroscopes in the market in the future. I see this. 
because this is a need, not only for sterilization reasons, but also for cost reasons and for educational reasons. The outcomes are the same, similar or the same. Uh, clearly, the contamination is very important for some countries and it satisfies the need, the need there also because no matter how well you sterilize your, uh, your reusable scope, you will always have issues with that. And uh, clearly in patients like pediatric population and anatomical deformations and anomalies, having a smaller scope is, is clearly a big benefit uh, on all this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Evangelos. Uh, excellent, um, excellent talk regarding this new development. Um, and, and I think that you clearly uh, um, explained that we now we open a new door uh, with single use um, a flexi uratarascop. Uh, it's like for the, the, the rest of the disposables, finally. If you, if you think about double G, we have multiple double G available today, not only one. <clears throat> same for the baskets or for uratarascope access sheet. And now it becomes the same with single use that many companies are able to develop different endoscopes. Uh, maybe as you said, more sophisticated with uh, sensors or things like that, uh, but also maybe also more simple for simple case. We, we don't need to have such uh, sophisticated uh, instruments. So my question, um, uh, Evangelos for you, if you were looking for just a, a a new improvement, something new that you really need today. Uh, would you discuss this sensor? Would you discuss um, uh, even smaller size? Uh, would you prefer to have a 3D, 3D picture? Because we have no 3D today uh, um, picture. What, what, is, what is your first need, actually? Well, uh, the first need for stone treatment, as I said. I, I think that the first need, uh, clearly, uh, is to, to have some idea of what you're doing in the kidney when you're operating. We've gone backwards, I think, with, uh, with flexible ureteroscopy. So we have uh, used very advanced equipment without knowing what is being performed up there. And uh, people uh, and flexible potentially can be very dangerous because people do not realize the danger. They go in. They put, everyone can put a wire up the ureter. On a pre-stented pre ureter, any urologist can go up with a ureteroscope. This is the potential danger. Not everyone can do a PCNL because they are afraid. They have the fear. The danger is present in PCNL. So for me, it is very important that the scopes give us ideas and we standardize certain things regarding temperature and pressures. This is the first step for me. All the rest is huge development that we will need to see 3D will make it much better because you will know exactly the angles. Yes, um, decreasing further the size would be very important uh, because you can go in much easier and you will be able to, to work easier. But if you don't standardize what you're doing up there and you don't know what the effects are up there, then it, it's really, it makes it a lot, a big problem for me. And uh, as I said, the fear for me is that uh, this thing is booming now a lot of people are, are doing it and they need to know their limits. So the limits can only come after standardization and standardization can only come if everyone, regardless if he's Traxer or Liatsikos or Sites or whoever, uh, he knows when he's working that he's using this kind of pressure and this kind of temperature. And then when he has a complication, he can go down and check, what did I do wrong with this case? Why did I have it? I was using this and that. So objectively, there will be outcomes and studies regarding the potential risks and what we do in reality. So for me, the first, the first uh, point to develop is sensors. Okay, I, I, I agree with you uh, completely, Evangelos, and I think that you, you, you gave a very strong message regarding these, uh, the safety, as you said, um, all the people are able to do flexible ureteroscopy, uh, and especially now with these uh, single-use uh, instruments, they are small, so not, not very complicated to, to put into the, into the kidney. And I would even say that now, since we're using more and more powerful um, uh, laser units, <clears throat> not only Olmium, but also these uh, new Tulium, they're super powerful. And I, I must say that I'm a little bit afraid uh, when I see some people using this super powerful uh, laser, 
uh, in, in different ways. So you're right, we need to know uh, exactly what we are doing now in terms of pressure and temperature. This is probably the next step that we need actually in terms of uh, development. Fully agree with you, uh, Evangelos. And I think it, make, um, it makes the transition with the next talk uh, with uh, Professor Pale Oster from, from Denmark. You, you know Pale. Pale is uh, one of the top experts regarding uh, uh, intrarenal pressure and I'm sure that uh, talking about the small size, it will address uh, some point regarding irrigation and intrarenal pressure. Pale, we are listening to you. Thank you very much, Olivier. I will uh, share my screen here. It's... Um, it's good to see you all, all your endo, endo friends, although virtually. And thank you, Poussin, for, for making this uh, happen. So I will discuss with you whether small size matters in, in flexible ureteroscopy and, and look into the risks of ureteroscopy and the benefits of uh, a small size single uh, scope. These are my disclosures. disclosures. Well, my hospital is located in Weiler in Denmark. And Weiler is a rather small city in Denmark. And Denmark is a rather small country in Scandinavia. So for us, of course, small is beautiful. So when looking into surgery from the patient's perspective, what is important? Of major importance, is the balance of efficacy and safety. And from the perspective of the patient, safety is of paramount importance. So when we are expanding the indications for flexible ureteroscopy, as we have just discussed, it is of major importance to look into safety. And as our old father Hippocrates said, make a habit of two things, to help or at least not to do harm. So as endurologists, we have to be the gentlest people in the world because we have to travel through the ureter and the ureter doesn't easily forgive you. So when you are entering the OR as an endurologist, you better leave your inner gorilla outside because the ureter is a thin walled, delicate, dynamic organ with a small lumen in which excessive force may be disastrous for the patient. And we don't want to leave uh, our patients with a ureter as you see on the left. So taking into consideration the small diameter of the ureter and especially the narrow sides of the UPJ and the crossing vessels and the ureteral uh, vesical junction. Intuitively, a small scope will help you being more gentle in the ureter. And as Albert Einstein said, the only real valuable thing is intuition. And it is like that for us as surgeons. If we don't intuitively feel that the uh, instruments, that the devices that we use, if we don't feel this is safe and it works, we will not use them. So intuition is of importance to us as surgeons, although this is very difficult to embrace uh, scientifically. So let's look at what happens when you are doing a flexible uh, ureteroscopy. Uh, when you're doing, a, uh, uh, when you are placing your ure uh, ureteroscope, the upper urinary tract will change from normal physiology to pathophysiology because when you're introducing the scope and you're irrigating, the pressure, the interrenal pressure will rise. And this will give, um, inter this will give a tubular, venous, and lymphatic backflow with potential septic uh, complications. And it may even cause uh, phonetial rupture and peripelvic extravasation 
and bleeding, as you see on the CT uh, on the right. This is when you uh, exceed certain pressures around 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. But this very often happens in flexible ureteroscopy. Furthermore, when the pressure increases, strain on the pelvic uh, wall will increase, and this will make uh, pacemaker cells fire, and you will have peristalsis. All who have done a ureteroscopy have seen peristaltic movements when you move up the, the ureteroscope, and this is due to the increase in intrarenal uh, pressure, and this may cause difficult access. However, and, and when, you are, when you are irrigating, the pressure will rise even further. However, as you see on the video on, uh, up on the upper right, irrigation is necessary to have a good vision. And this is also about safety. And irrigation is needed for cooling when we are using uh, these higher power effective lasers. So with regard to safety, there are three aspects in flexible ureteroscopy that's of major importance and that's the interrenal pressure, access related problems, and the temperature when we are using our lasers. And this makes me look into the pathophysiological circle of ureteroscopy. For all these three aspects are interrelated, the interrenal pressure, the temperature, and the access related problems. All of these aspects of flexible ureteroscopy are interrelated when it comes to complications in, in, in the procedure. And my statement is that the majority of complications in flexible ureteroscopy are related to the interrenal pressure because it affects both uh, um, the septic complications, the access related complications, and also uh, the aspects around the temperature. So how can we decrease interrenal pressure? Well, it has been shown in several studies that ureteral access sheets unequivocally reduces intrarenal pressure during flexible ureteroscopy. This is one of the old studies which now have been, become classic from the Preminger group in the United States. And they unequivocally showed that when using a ureteral access sheet, the pressure uh, were lower, it was, they were able to do flexible ureteroscopy at much lower pressure. They used 12, 14 or, or uh, 12, 14 sheets. And when it comes to using ureteral acid sheets, there are a few truths that I will share with you. Of course, as shown in this study by Senner and, and co-workers, it's important to choose a ureteral access sheet that is compatible with your ureteroscope. However, there are a few statements which I consider truth in, 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 in regarding ureteral access sheets. And one of them is that to maintain a low interrenal interpelvic uh, pressure and acceptable flow rates during flexible ureteroscopy with laser lithotripsy, the ratio of endoscope sheath dynamometer should be kept below 0.75 as has been shown in um, the study of uh, Fang and co-workers. And by keeping this below 0.75, you will have a good balance between uh, interrenal pressure, uh, irrigation flow, and, and, and in order to reduce the temperature and have, have a good vision. And definitely a pressure the pressure flow irrigation um, relation favors a smaller ureteroscope in any ureteral access sheets. And this comes both with regard to favorable uh, clinical outcomes, as has been shown in the study on the left by Comeyer and co workers, and also regarding interrenal pressures and regarding lowering temperature during um, ureteroscopy using high power lasers, because when you have sufficient irrigation, you don't see these uh, significant temperature rises. The other statement I consider truth with regard to ureteral access sheets uh, is obvious. 
because the urethral axis necessarily has to be bigger than, ure than the urethroscope. And this makes the urethral axis seat a potential double-edged sword. On one hand, it decreases interrenal pressures and give us a better uh, balance between flow and, and pressure. However, on the other hand, it increases the strain on the urethral wall and has been shown in, in several publications that when placing a urethral axis seat, this in some cases will result in lesions to the urethral wall as shown as in this, I would say now rather classic paper by Traxair and Thomas, uh, in which in, in considerable amount of patients, uh, uh, urethral lesions were seen. Uh, in this study, a 12, 14 uh, French urethral axis sheets was uh, used. And they also showed that pre-standing decreased the risk of severe injury sevenfold. And this is because by pre-stenting, you are making the ureter into a, uh, a dilated, a, a dynamic uh, system. We have shown in, in experimental studies that definitely when placing a urethral axis sheet, you will affect the urethral wall. In this study, we showed that there was a dramatic increase in pro-inflammatory markers such as cyclooxygenase 2 and tumor necrosis factor uh, alpha, and also we look into the histopathological changes when we uh, do when we are placing a urethral axis sheet, and we evaluated the histopathological uh, uh, pictures of the urethral wall lesions after U.S. placement, and it revealed a significantly higher degree of severity than observed endoscopically. So clearly, endoscopy underestimated the histopathological extent of the lesions. Whether this has any clinical implications, we don't know. However, um, we studied this further in a clinical scenario in, in, in a consecutive, consecutive group of patients in which we used a smaller sized urethral axis sheet, uh, uh, 10, 12 urethral axis sheets, and it was clearly demonstrated by downsizing the sheet we have uh, the, the extent of the urethral lesions was much less. And so uh, by downsizing your, the urethral axis sheet, you can downsize the potential lesions. However, by downsizing the urethral axis sheet, you need a smaller urethroscope to have a good balance between pressure and uh, irrigation flow. So definitely axis safety favors a smaller urethroscope, both when it comes to safety aspects and efficacy aspects. So again, looking at the pathophysiological circle of ureteroscopy, definitely small size matters in flexible ureteroscopy. It affects uh, both the interrenal pressure, the temperature, and the axis <coughs> aspects in a favorable manner. So by downsizing your instruments, our instruments, we can, uh, we can safely say to our patients that we will take care of your tube and make it into our tube. And by downsizing the instruments, we have got a valuable instruments for personalized to take into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pale, for this, uh, as always, uh, beautiful and perfect uh, talk and uh, this uh, so well-known uh, international PSA uh, approach. Um, uh, so, uh, Pale, just um, a quick question, maybe a little bit um, challenging, but do you think that by using smaller and smaller ureteroscope that we still need actually to use ureteral access sheath uh, to increase uh, the backflow since we have more space into the ureter and especially if the patient is pristent, um, do you think that we still need actually to use more or less systematically ureteral access sheath? <clears throat> 
I, I clearly think that that we will be we will be using regional access sheets less uh, in the future because these small scopes will allow uh, the uh, drainage alongside uh, the scope. Uh, so so definitely and especially if if patients are pre extended, uh, uh, we will have a system that will allow uh, the volume of what we are irrigating to flow down alongside uh, the the the, uh, the scope what will be what will we be um, what we also should acknowledge is that actually when we are using a urethral access sheath the, the the fluid is coming out of the patient if we are not using a urethral access sheath it will accumulate in the bladder so without using the urethral access sheath we'll have to take care of the bladder filling because that will contribute to to the to the pressure in the upper tract. Yeah, I think it's a, it's an excellent comment, uh, Palais. So maybe we need uh, maybe to discuss with the companies to develop something to drain the bladder and maybe not uh, drain the, the kidney in the in the future. Very yeah. very interesting. Thank you, Palais. Uh, since again we are a little bit late, I would like to move now with the uh, next uh, talk with uh, Professor uh, Al Rifai. And now uh, we will uh, have uh, uh, an experience with this new uh, uh, 7.5 uh, flexible uh, single-use uh, ureteroscope. I think all of us, we already tested. All of us, uh, I think, were very happy to, to use this new scope, very, uh, um, uh, very useful and very interesting. But now we would like to listen from you about your experience with uh, this uh, endoscope. Greetings from uh, Switzerland. Uh, as my colleague from Denmark said, we are also a small country with uh, low uh, volume. And uh, I am uh, sitting in uh, this uh, beautiful uh, hospital in a very uh, beautiful region. <clears throat> and after these excellent uh, speeches and detailed speeches, I wanted also to share with you my first and initial experiences with uh, uh, before I want to say that uh, since 2018, we switched completely from reusable to uh, single use. We don't use any reusable no more. And uh, my first experience with the smaller Usen 7.5 French, it was on uh, first day, 27 May. The patient <coughs> was uh, 56 years old with a uh, seven millimeter stone was covered with the uh, mucosa and it was in a very uh, <clears throat> a labyrinthy uh, calyx. It was very difficult to, to, to reach it. That's why we choose uh, our first case uh, with this smaller uh, to uh, show uh, how, uh, how different is it. So this is uh, the first view of it. We, use, we used also the new processor and uh, it was a very big uh, difference between the old processor of Fusion and the new one. The new one is very uh, excellent with a very excellent vision as, as you see. And here you see the stone covered by the mucosa. Uh, I couldn't uh, get it to the basket before. Uh, so I uh, tried to, to laser it and then it, it has been smaller and then uh, I took it with the circle basket out. So this is the controlling of the calyces after the operation and after removing the sheet. So for comparison between the both of them, this is uh, exactly for the first uh, operation for me. And uh, as all my colleagues said, it's reducing the damaging of the ureta because it is smaller. The irrigation was better. The flexibility, it was, uh, it was also uh, in difficult uh, anatomy, very uh, excellent. And I didn't uh, insert any double G after the operation. So, I have to talk about advantage and disadvantage. I didn't realize any disadvantage. I realized only advantages between the old one and the smaller new one. So, thank you. 
thank you for this uh, uh, experience. Um, one of my questions is, of course, since you, you try this uh, endoscope, uh, do you think that you will, it will be part of your uh, uh, instruments now? Uh, would you, you will still uh, stay and, and wait uh, to see uh, other experience of uh, colleagues before you will include this new uh, endoscope in your uh, instrumentation? Or do you think, uh, are you ready actually just to uh, include this uh, new endoscope in your um, instrumentation? Yes, I already uh, included in, in my new instrument because uh, it is, it is, uh, I like it very much and uh, I am uh, operating kids between six years and uh, up to six years in our hospital. Uh, so I uh, would like to, to use it also in, in childhood. Okay. No, very interesting. As I said uh, in my introduction, you know, I think all of us, uh, we tested this uh, new uh, new endoscope, and I think that uh, there's like some kind of consensus that it looks yeah. really, really uh, interesting. To be honest, personally, I was a bit afraid when I was waiting for this uh, test. I was a bit afraid about the fragility of this endoscope. Since we are uh, going smaller, uh, we can imagine that the scope is becoming uh, maybe more fragile. I was really surprised, I must say, I was really surprised. I did three cases, but I was very surprised to, to realize that the scope were, uh, was really strong, uh, yeah. very comparable to uh, the one I'm using uh, uh, every day. Uh, and for me, it was really the, the main point. I guess you have exactly the, the same feeling. Um, yeah. so, so it seems, it seems uh, so logical actually to consider these uh, uh, this uh, endoscope in uh, our, um, our our instrumentation, regular instrumentation. So thank you, thank you very much for, for your you comments for uh, regarding your experience. Uh, and of course, uh, saying that um, uh, we are coming to, to the last, but not the least uh, uh, point uh, discussion. And this is of course the cost. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Lietzikos already mentioned that uh, this is really a, a limiting factor uh, in many, many countries. Uh, we cannot say in few countries, this is the main problem uh, everywhere. Uh, maybe in the States, uh, in the United States, it's uh, uh, easier for them to consider a single use uh, as a, a single endoscope. Uh, but we must say that the cost is really an issue. So it's my pleasure actually to uh, welcome um, my, my colleague, my French colleague, uh, Eric uh, Le Chevalier. He's working in Marseille, in south of France, in beautiful place, of course. Uh, and uh, Eric did uh, a nice uh, uh, cost evaluation in France. And uh, Eric, uh, can you uh, share your experience regarding uh, cost and single-use um, ureteroscope? Yes, of course, Olivier. Uh, good morning to uh, everyone and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Olivier and Pearson, for your invitation and for the organization of this uh, very nice uh, uh, web webinar. So thank you, uh, thank you uh, very much for this uh, invitation and this uh, very important uh, symposium. Sy sy symposium. It's, uh, it's uh, a new area in uh, upper urine tract uh, endoscopy. So uh, uh, we, we said previously that there are some uh, drawbacks in uh, uh, flexible retroscopy, uh, especially for reusable. And uh, uh, one of the, ma the main drawback is probably the fragility. When we start all of them, uh, flexible retroscopy uh, uh, in, the, in the kidney, uh, probably uh, all of you and Olivier remember that we, can, we, we could perform more than 20 or 30 flexible ureteroscopy with the reusable without any breakage. And right now, this uh, fragility is increasing and probably the duration of, uh, uh, of the reusable uh, ureteroscopes is close to 10 to all in between 10 and 20 procedures. And when you say, when you send your flexible reusable ureteroscope, ureteroscope to, the, to, 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 to the manufacturer for reparation, they return you not a new one, 
they return you a repaired one. So more we, more you use your flexible reusable, more it becomes fragile. So that's why we observe in our center that the duration of our reusable uh, ureteroscopy is decreasing. And of course, one uh, another drawback is the, the, the cost. And uh, we you have here the, the cost in, in euros. But the, the, this, is, this is the direct cost. There is a lot, lot, lot of indirect cost. And uh, it depends on the study uh, of what we include in uh, uh, the, um, the cost effectiveness study uh, for the evaluation of the cost of a flexible retroscopy. It includes repair, uh, postpone uh, procedure, cleaning, morbidity, and of course, and we will see that it's probably one of the most important points for uh, single use is the waste management. What about the cancellation? We review uh, in, uh, in Marseille uh, uh, three, three years ago, the rate of cancellation of plan ureteroscopy. More than 400 ureteroscopy in 2017. One third were, were postponed. And 30% of the uh, plan ureteroscopy, that means 40% of the postponed ureteroscopy, was due, were due to an availability of the reusable, 30%, 57 patients. Uh, if we look at the, the cost and the breakage, the main drawbacks of uh, uh, reusable uh, ureteroscopy, this is, these data are from a very nice paper uh, from uh, Canada, Quebec. That's why it's in French. But if you can see here, is the, the mean number of cases before a breakage of a reusable flexible ureteroscopy during the recent years. And you see that there is a very, very small cases per endoscopy, per endoscope before breakage, in between seven and 12 cases before breakage. And that means, in, or it, it, it could be translated in the risk of breakage when you plan a, re, a flexible ureteroscopy. And this risk is 6%, 6% of risk of breakage. And in this, in this uh, study, the, the, the duration of reparation of unavailability was 14 days. In our center, it's much, much more longer. Here you have the, the, the cost. Of the of the of the procedure, but it's very difficult to compare the uh, in the same study in the same country the real cost of uh, uh, flexible retroscopy with re reusable or single view. What what you can see there is in some series no extra cost, and in other series there there are a lot of extra extra cost from. The, the, the simple to the double cost. Okay, we go back to our study and uh, uh, to uh, the uh, 57 uh, schedule um, postpone new retroscopy because unavailability. And in uh, 2017, 17, the length of unavailability we had five flexible reusable ureteroscopy was 200 days, 200 days. That it's close to six months, six months. And the repair cost was different between the fiber and the digital, digital fiber uh, fi uh, flexible ureteroscopy. It close to 10,000 euros a year for a sing for a one ureteroscope fiber. And it was 40, uh, 15 euros for a digital one. That's why very, very high. And we uh, published our series uh, two, two years ago about this evaluation. And we perform uh, close to, we include in this study 300 procedures. We had five uh, reusable uh, uh, flexible ureteroscopy and in uh, for our uh, procedure, 
we had every day in between one and three ureteroscope. That means in some days we had no available flexible ureteroscope, sometimes five, but most of the time it's close to three ureteroscope in five. The cost of repair of this reusable ball for the year was 73,000 uh, euros and the mean duration was close to six months. In 2017, we introduced in our, our practice the single use uh, Pusen ureteroscopy. And we can perform ureteroscopy because of this uh, single use in close to 100 cases. And it cost to our center 19,000 euros. Here are the, uh, the details of the, of the cost, the consumer, uh, consumables, the water, transport, paramedical staff. And here are the, the cost uh, for uh, each ureteroscope during uh, one year in 2017. And you, you see here the cost, and here you have the fiber one and the numeric one. This, this cost is very cheap for this uh, numeric because remember that he, uh, usually it's, uh, uh, it's close to uh, 10,000 uh, 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 euros. And the mean repair for a, a year for a reusable flexible ureteroscope in our center is, was 10,000 euros. So if we look at uh, uh, in this same study, the available availability of reusable ureteroscope in orange. This is the curve of the availability. And as you can see in May uh, 2017 and in November, in five ureteroscopes reusable, we had no uh, reusable available for the, for the procedure. Hopefully we had the single use plus, plus one, the standard one, and we can maintain our activity of uh, plan ureteroscopy. Always for, for the cost, and we, we spoke about that uh, during the, the, the previous presentation, uh, there is the length of the cleaning, and in our center it's uh, one hour, 40 euros. The cost per, per pro, pro, procedure for uh, our activity was uh, three, uh, uh, three, uh, more than 300 euros, but including purchase, cleaning, sterilization, and so on, and so on including bacter bacteriological uh, testing. But we had to add the, the repair, and the repair depends on the volume of the activity, for example. The cost of single-use flexible ureteroscopy it depends on the country, depends on the, uh, of the center, is in between 600 and uh, 1,200 euros. And I think it's closer to 600 than 1,200. And it, we can estimate another cost of 300 euros. But it's very difficult to compare because this cost for a procedure with a single uh, flexible ureteroscopy depends of the volume of the activity a year that we can resume as the profitability. And we evaluate this prof pro prof profitability in, a, in our center, always in the uh, same study. Here in gray, you have the cost of reusable flexible ureteroscopy in 2017 here in gray. In comparison, uh, the orange line was the cost of reusable in, in between two, uh, 2011 and 2016. And that's uh, to demonstrate you that actually the reusable are more and more expensive. So if here in yellow is the curve of the expense of the reusable, and the cross, the cross, the point of the, the crossing of the two lines in our center and the cutoff of prof profitability was in this year, 73 flexible ureteroscopes. Since the, the, this year, we increase our activity because of unavailability. 
And before the COVID year in 2019, we performed 220 single uh, use flexible utroscopy. That means 60% of our activity of a, a, a retrograde intrarenal surgery was with uh, single use flexible urethroscopy. Last year was, uh, uh, as you can imagine, uh, uh, an exceptional year, but actually we are slowly moving to, uh, to more and more uh, uh, single use retroscopy for uh, our infrarenal uh, retrograde surgery. In the literature, this cutoff of profitability uh, varies from uh, 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 sl uh, um, a little, uh, a small cutoff in between uh, 30 procedures a year to close to 100 uh, single uh, use flexible utroscopy pr pr procedure a year. So in our center, it was uh, 73 procedures of, uh, uh, for this cutoff. So that's the, the, the cost and the, the, the yeah, the cost of the single-use retroscopy, which is quite difficult to evaluate. And each center uh, has to perform this kind of evaluation to have this cutoff uh, to select uh, uh, the, the, the ratio of uh, uh, single-use versus uh, uh, reusable procedure. And what, what is very important and for me, it's, I, I, I think, uh, a main point for the single use is the waste management. More often, when we discuss with, uh, with you discuss with colleagues, they say that single use is very bad for the environment. In fact, we uh, 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 evaluate the waste management uh, in our center. You use uh, in our center, we uh, perform high level decontamination with parasitic. Uh, acid. Some centers use sterat, uh, sterat, but our center we our center we do not have the sterat. You use a lot of water, a lot of water, disposal kit, sets, material, and we talked before previously about the carbon carbon footprint. For example, for example, and we do we, we do a study uh, uh, comparing uh, the uh, the waste man management for. Uh, a reusable cystoscope, cystoscope and single use cystoscope. And for example, for a decontamination of a reusable cystoscope, we, we use, we use for a, each cystoscope, 60 liter of water and 800 gram of waste, 800 gram. It's probably the same for a ureteroscopy. And it's, it must be compared to the pusen, the regular one, 200 gram, and the milli pusen, uh, 177 gram. And this uh, single use uh, ureteroscopy are managed with incineration. And on, uh, okay. on this slide, it's probably uh, one of the most important slides of this webinar, uh, for my, for, in my opinion, is the waste, the waste. And this is the, uh, 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 a picture of the waste uh, of tools used for the decontamination of a cystoscope. And you must add the water and the acid parasitic. So in conclusion, so actually, sure, single use flexible ureteroscopy is slightly more expensive than uh, reusable flexible ureteroscopy. That's why it can be used in selected cases. But this price depends on the purchase of flexible ureteroscopy, reusable and single use, and the volume of activity as we, we saw. And in the for the future for our children, single use uh, flexible ureteroscopy is better, much better and better than reusable. So in the next future, quality, safety, cost, ergonomy, ecology, we, uh, we, we will switch to uh, 100 single use uh, of uh, uh, medical material, especially for uh, uh, ureteroscopy. Thank you very much.
Thank you, uh, thank you, Eric, for this uh, uh, very nice uh, experience regarding cost and also cost evaluation. Because in fact, what we can understand is at your place, this is cost effective because you um, you evaluate this. We also realize that um, all of us, if we would like to 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 know if it's cost effective or not, we will have to do exactly what you did. Um, we need uh, uh, to have this uh, evaluation, otherwise it's very difficult to, uh, to tell the, the people, the administration in, in the hospital, that there is a benefit or not uh, using a single use. But, uh, but again, if we, if we um, listen, um, Evangelos, for example, because he mentioned that, uh, he said that uh, in, in his country, in Greece, in, in Petras, it's probably not exactly the same. So cost is really, really, uh, really an issue. Um, it will probably uh, become uh, much easier in the in the future since the, the price uh, uh, are becoming uh, uh, also are decreasing actually. And if I uh, I remember, you know, um, the first introduction of um, a single-use flexible ureteroscope, it was from from Boston Scientific. And I remember um, at the AUA, it was in San Diego. Uh, what about the discussion? You know, all the people were complaining um, to explain that it was just impossible to use single use because of the cost and also because it was not green. Uh, and many people were complaining with that. And you can see that after a few years, uh, it, it looks so um, evident. So, uh, easy to understand that the way the future of flexible ureteroscopy is single use, and uh, at the end it's uh, uh, it's green. Uh, uh, we, uh, as you nicely uh, demonstrate uh, when I saw your pictures, and for the costs, as always, regarding new technologies, we know that in in few years it will not become again um, an issue. So. Eric, what is your recommendation to, to do this uh, evaluation in our centers? What do you recommend to the people to start this uh, evaluation? How to do it? Uh, uh, it's, uh, as you mentioned, it's very important to perform it uh, in each center. But you can't do it uh, 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 on, uh, on, alone. You, you have to include in uh, in uh, in uh, your uh, process the the, um, uh, the the drug specialist, the, the infectious spe specialist, the economist of your center, and uh, every one every specialist can evaluate the 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 real cost because uh, it's obvious uh, if you only take account in count the direct cost. There is no doubt, uh, reusable is uh, uh, wins. But when you include the indirect cost and for uh, especially the postpone uh, and the cancellation and the cancel procedure, it becomes an advantage for uh, single use. So you have to to build a, a, a team with uh, uh, with with your director, with your administrator, with your uh, infectious specialist and urologist, uh, and, and this is the team uh, who can have the good arguments to defend this uh, this uh, the the single use uh, uh, in your center. Yeah, thank you, Eric. So um, since we, we we started with uh, Christian. Um, uh, uh, with the first talk, our, our, and Christian mentioned that he's using more or less exclusively the single use, if I well uh, uh, understood. So Christian, can I ask you just a, a last comment regarding um, cost and uh, what is your recommendation? Yeah, sure. I think we, we have heard um, a lot of interesting aspects, different aspects about that. Um, costs are as you said, directly, probably higher. However, finally, because of those um, positive side effects, uh, and the special issue is the always availability of the scope, no rescheduling, um, less problems with infections and so on. So we heard everything. All those parameters led us to the decision to use primarily um, single-use scopes. And I think 
that is a development that goes further and including teaching. There's so many aspects on it, so many favorable aspects for the single use scope that I think um, that was what persuaded us and that is what will also come in the future. Yeah, I agree, I agree, Christian. And you know, um, I remember 20 years ago in France when we, when we started together with Eric to develop this technology in France, I can tell you that all the French colleagues were complaining to say uh, flexible ureteroscopy, this is like a gadget, this is so uh, expensive. And then we had exactly the same discussion when a digital endoscope came a little bit later. And then we had also the same discussion with laser technology and the disposable. And now we have again the same discussion uh, because of single use flexible ureteroscope. It seems so terrible, you know, to, to put in the trash uh, an endoscope at the end of the, uh, of the surgery. And I think this is something that we have difficulties to accept, you know, to, to take an endoscope and to destroy the endoscope. Uh, we have no so many concerns when we are looking about ureteral access sheath and baskets and wires and ureteral catheter, you know, they are single use, um, but we have not the same feeling. Huh? But just because it's an endoscope with a chip on the tip, we are, we are feeling it's terrible to, to put this uh, in the trash. Um, I would like you to conclude because we are a little bit late, not, not too much, I must say. So, I would like really to thank all of you for the, these uh, beautiful talk, excellent information uh, regarding these uh, topics. Uh, I was so happy to see uh, all of you today and to uh, listening to uh, your great uh, talks. So again, uh, on behalf of uh, Puzen, I would like to thank you and I hope that we will uh, be uh, very soon all together to have good drinks and good discussions. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, Olivier. Goodbye. Thank you, Olivier. Bye-bye. Bye-bye to all of you. Bye. Stay safe.